Hello and welcome everybody uh, to our session today on uh, the title, which is uh, Wikipedia's Public Scholarship. My name is Erin Fields and I am the Open Education and Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with our speakers today. I uh, engage in a lot of Wikipedia work. Uh, one which is a co-sponsor for the event today, which is Honoring Indigenous Writers on Wikipedia, which is an event that is happening through the month of March. Uh, so this is a moderated conversation and uh, we will focus on Wikipedia as a form of public scholarship. Our panelists today will reflect on and consider a range of topics related to Wikipedia and how they participate, incorporate it into pedagogical practices um, and to engage in research around it. Uh, each panelist will be given 10 to 15 minutes to speak about their practices before we open it up to discussion and a, a Q&A. But before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, UBC, which is hosting the session today, is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, UBC Okanagan campus is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people. Um, one thing I always like to recognize, especially when we're talking about public scholarship or open scholarship, is um, I like to acknowledge that much of open education is grounded in notions of copyright law and ownership. And these notions really are in tension with indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. Uh, so while we won't really be exploring necessarily these tensions today, or maybe we will in the q and I do like to state that I recognize that those tensions exist. Uh, so it's important that we recognize that and are aware of that as we work in public scholarship. So to introduce our first speaker, our uh, first speaker today is David Gartner, who is an assistant professor in the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. His articles have appeared in Canadian Literature, American Indian Cultural and Research Journal, and Bioethical Inquiry, among other publications. He is the editor of the Sokihita the poetry of sky dancer Louise Bernice Half and read, listen, tell indigenous stories from Turtle Island with Sophie McCall, Deanna Redder, and Gabriel Leandrell Hill. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you, Erin. Um, it's great to share this space with you. And I know Alex is here as well too. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Honoring Indigenous Writers. Um, it's become a festival now. Um, it began as an event and it's exploded into something a little bit more. Um, and it's, it's a little bit strange to be talking about it by myself because I think that this work has been a, is, is immensely collaborative um, and um, is something that really uh, it takes a, a really big and dedicated team to put together. And a lot of, I mean, most of what I've learned about Wikipedia, I've learned from Erin. Um, so it, it only makes sense that she's uh, the one leading this session. So uh, I, I want to promote this event a little bit today, but I also want to, this is also a chance for me to sort of narrativize how we arrived at honoring Indigenous writers, which is now in its third year. Um, and it has gone from something that we did in classrooms with my students to something that went to the longhouse. Uh, and now that it's something that has sort of spread over two months and is, is helping, helping to launch a major book of poetry um, on March 24th. So it's, a, um, it's been a really fulfilling uh, project. Uh, it's been um, something that I, I feel really good about putting my energy into. And it's been something that uh, my students have been really excited about as well. So I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that today. This actually came up, strangely enough, Facebook is good for some things, but this came up in my Facebook feed today, you know, those memory things they have. Um, this was, I think, one of the first uh, edit-a-thons that I did with Aaron with my Indigenous New Media class. So you can actually see students hard at work at Wikipedia articles. I think this is actually four years ago um, when we, we started to, to bring this idea together. So you can see students here. We're actually in the bottom of Kerner Library here. Those heavy days when we could be on campus. I look forward to them again. 
Uh, and um, what I want to talk about today is something that I've been thinking through a little bit and something that I, I, I hope maybe resonates across the speakers today, um, but thinking about Wikipedia as process. Um, and um, I'm going to try to dig into that a little bit more, but some of what I'm coming actually comes out of this great book um, uh, called Data Feminism, um, where the, the authors in there look at these different ways uh, in which uh, feminism and data are related. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting place to start, and particularly in this last point, which is something that I'll, I'll try to unpack a bit as we move forward. Um, but thinking about um, data feminism as a process um, and in that it challenges power by building participatory, inclusive processes of knowledge production. And I think for me, that's really at the core of what I see Wiki, uh, the Wikipedia events that we do as, and it's also what I see it as um, in terms of um, public scholarship. Not so much in terms of what we produce out of that, although that is important, um, but the ways in which editathons and these events collectivize us the ways that they galvanize community um, and bring us together in um, now online spaces, but also in physical spaces like the Longhouse. I think that there's something um, notable to be drawn out of there that uh, in Indigenous studies um, and, and uh, feminist perspectives in the digital humanities are getting at as well too. Um, uh, of course, we don't always have, um, there's tension, and some misalignments between feminism uh, and indigenous studies that um, folks like my colleague Dory Nason have pointed to as well. Um, and, and of course, there are tensions between um, what Wikipedia does, and Aaron mentioned this as well, um, and what this, this whole notion of openness does, what that means in relation to indigenous studies. There are tensions there that, that we need to explore, particularly in ways in which open, the concept of openness sort of reenacts um, the doctrine of discovery and notions of terra nullius in those spaces. Um, but, but I am compelled, I've been reading Vine Deloria um, uh, again, when, when in doubt, um, go to Vine Deloria. This is actually from something he wrote in 1978 um, uh, for the, the U.S. Library of, Conference, uh, Library of Congress conference um, that was held at the White House in 1978. Um, and Deloria, of course, has makes some really compelling and prescient arguments for indigenous sovereignty, but he was also uh, an information scientist uh, in, in really some brilliant ways and really some very forward thinking ways. Uh, and part of the argument that he makes in this 1978 paper is about what he calls the right to know, um, the right to know the past, to know traditional alternatives advocated by their ancestors, to know the specific experiences of their communities, he's speaking of indigenous peoples here in those pronouns, and to know about the world that surrounds them in the same intimate manner that they want to know the plains, mountains, deserts, rivers, and woods. And what he's specifically talking about here in connecting the right to know to indigenous sovereignty um, is the fact that this knowledge has been stolen from indigenous people, um, and it's been stolen by universities and by the state um, and put to the use of uh, non-Indigenous scholars and to the use of the state um, to further the project of settler colonialism. Um, so what he is calling for here is a reclamation, a repatriation of knowledge, um, bringing that knowledge home uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and um, I, this compels me because um, I, I, there are, I think that there are ways to think this through um, with Wikipedia. I am not, I'm by no means going to make the argument that Wikipedia is the answer that Deloria was calling for um, in 1978. Um, it, it is, Wikipedia is also massively flawed. Uh, and as we can see, the, this is actually from Wikipedia's own page on systematic bias. Um, is still very, very white, very male. Um, uh, the social economic status of folks is basically the same. Um, so we are not thinking necessarily that Wikipedia is going to be the answer to repatriate knowledge. Um, but I think there is room, there is space in there um, to think about how Wikipedia um, can be a place um, to give knowledge back, or at least to begin to deconstruct or chip away um, at the colonial edifice that maintains, that strives, um, that has this death grip on indigenous knowledge. Um, and that it means uh, having an editing processes where we are welcoming in um, community and finding spaces to push back um, against the whiteness 
um, in these spaces. So, so again, I'm not, I, there's, I'm not, there's not a one-to-one. -one. I'm not saying that Deloria was making this space, um, was pushing to a space like this, although he was thinking about digital spaces even at this time. Um, but, but that there is room to think about the right to know and, and how that might apply um, within Wikipedia. And this is something that more um, current scholars like Jennifer O'Neill um, are thinking through right now as well too, and thinking about what the archive means uh, in relation to Indigenous people. So she's writing about information and knowledge um, and how their repatriation is critical um, to the contemporary, um, contemporary self-determination. Um, so um, these, these are ongoing conversations that are happening and thinking of Wikipedia in terms of the archive is an interesting idea. Um, so I just wanted to sort of quickly walk you through where, where we began with honoring Indigenous writers and moving from the classroom to the community. Um, the work that Aaron and I and Alex um, have done together to, to bring this, uh, these events together. Um, so like I said, it did originate sort of out of some, um, some projects that we've done in a couple of my classrooms. Um, and building on the work of uh, my friend and colleague Siobhan Sen uh, Senye uh, and her work in uh, indigenizing Wikipedia. Um, so I am like um, uh, Senye, I am compelled by using Wikipedia as a teacher um, because I like how it, um, it facilitates my role uh, as a facilitator um, rather than a gatekeeper, um, as she puts it. Um, and it also creates an opportunity to improve the representation of Indigenous literature on Wikipedia um, and um, hopefully to reshape some of its demographics um, by welcoming in um, uh, Indigenous students, Indigenous colleagues, um, uh, racialized students to think through about uh, how knowledge is represented in this space and how they can enter, uh, how they can actually intervene um, as uh, producers of knowledge. Uh, and I think this, this is why I continue to find uh, Wikipedia compelling um, as a classroom instrument. I'm sort of for these three ideas, which I sort of just jotted down. They're not hard fast uh, by any means, but they, what Wikipedia does, and I'm thinking about this in relationship again to Deloria, um, uh, um, is uh, that they make uh, indigenous students active participants in knowledge production. Um, Wikipedia interrupts colonial control over indigenous knowledges. Um, and it encourages community engagement um, and reciprocity, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So again, this, these are, we are chipping away. This is not a solve all by any means here. Um, we are, uh, the colonial control over indigenous knowledge is, will be maintained despite um, the, the entries that are made in Wikipedia by students in my classes. Um, but it, I think what is most valuable there is the ways in which that students can see themselves um, as participating um, in knowledge production and dissemination. Uh, and I think that in itself interrupting the, the hierarchies of knowledge that the academy is built on um, and it, illustrating to students the points in which they can become experts. Um, often I have students who are, are building or editing, correcting Wikipedia pages on their own communities. Um, who are self-determining um, in these spaces um, and in ways that they can see results. So pages getting five, 6,000 views um, using data that they have, they brought from their own community to fulfill those pages. Um, so uh, again, breaking, getting them to think critically about knowledge hierarchies in these spaces um, and how they can intervene um, and what their participation means and that, um, that it is meaningful, um, I think is a really important point. Um, this is uh, just a, a, a quick excerpt from the self um, from the Wikipedia assignment that we have, um, which uh, includes a gap analysis uh, that I'll throw up in the chat for people to look at um, if they want afterwards. Um, um, but really, when we we get students into these spaces, um, we we tell them that the goal is not to make these changes stick necessarily. Uh, Wikipedia has a number of barriers um, that we need to get over, uh, and a lot of that is connected um, to uh, what is considered, I forget the terminology, but viable knowledge. Um, but um, getting students to think about what self-determination means in those spaces um, can, be really, can be really valuable. So we first just get them to read critically um, through Wikipedia, see what is missing, see what it means when an Indigenous writer is represented as Canadian or their nation 
um, is not included, um, or um, using capitalization for things like indigenous, um, but boiling things down um, to critique in those ways. Um, so moving from there very quickly um, to uh, honoring indigenous writers. Um, this is actually a poster that was created um, by uh, Robin Mitchell Cranfeld Field um, for uh, Daniel Justice. So the, the hashtag that we use for this project, what, um, honoring indigenous writers, is actually a hashtag that, that my colleague Daniel Justice began um, before he'd even published his book, his very important book, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter. Um, so uh, just in the, the very beginning of 2015, he uh, was, uh, the way he tells that he was tired of people telling him when he told them that he uh, was a professor of indigenous literature, he was tired of people saying, indigenous people have literature? Is there enough to study in that field? Um, so he decided he was going to uh, tweet an indigenous author every day for 365 years. And Leanne Simpson said, um, well, you should give that a hashtag. Um, and so uh, she, between Leanne and Daniel, they came up with this, this hashtag, honoring indigenous writers. Um, as, and as he writes uh, in Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, that this was um, created in order to push back against the frequent assumptions that our literary history is any less complex, robust, or diverse of that of any other people. So we, um, with permission from Daniel, and he usually kicks off our events every year as well too, um, we have used this um, hashtag as a way to collectivize um, new communities and to con continue to promote and support Indigenous authors, um, both through Wikipedia um, events, editing events and challenges. Uh, we have a number of them set up this year. It's really exciting to see um, what the team put together, um, but also in ev live events that we hold, to, we hold as well. So this, this is our objectives in that space. Um, so the Honoring Indigenous Writers on Wikipedia event seems to, it seeks to improve the coverage of Indigenous writers on Wikipedia and to encourage diverse community editors to actively work to dissuade assumptions about Indigenous literature by raising the profiles of Indigenous authors in this increasingly influential information source. So to come sort of loop back to this, this idea of Wikipedia's process, um, I think what uh, the assignment does in the classroom and what the the events, the festival does, um, namely, and what I see as being some of its most important contributions um, is the way in which it promotes community, the way that we bring together Indigenous authors, fans of Indigenous authors, um, folks who want to support that work, who see the importance of supporting that work. Um, it, it, it brings us together in a shared space. Um, it uh, centers Indigenous voices. Um, I think the core to what makes honoring Indigenous writers work is the fact that we work, our, our sort of baseline is working on practices of consent. So anything that is edited, anything that is developed uh, inside Wikipedia, we actually have a master list of authors we've been in touch with um, who are looking for edits and authors contact us. Um, so we are, are working in good relation with those folks. And that this, this isn't parachute Wikipedia in either. That we have people contact us outside of the event looking for support editing something or getting a picture changed, um, which has, the team has been really great and helping to support as well. And that sort of leads to this third point that it facilitates um, participatory and reciprocal um, knowledge production um, in good relation um, with Indigenous authors. Um, so um, bringing that, that idea of process back um, and this is, again, me trying to think through this a little bit more and reading Leanne Simpson's gorgeous essay, Bubbling Like a Beating Heart, which is in uh, Indigenous Poetics in Canada. Um, she, um, Simpson, also talks about maker spaces um, and the ways in which we, uh, Indigenous folks, collectivize um, in, in these spaces and the ways in which um, allied folks like myself can be in, involved in these spaces. Uh, and so she writes, when we engage in our own culturally based poetics and narrative consciousness, we can to a greater degree create healing spaces for our people, spaces where for a few minutes we can experience the love, the connection and the liberation that our ancestors are so desperately trying to build, to bring into the contemporary rea realities we face um, as colonized people. Um, and I think that this notion of um, collectivized engagement um, that is built around poetics, that is built around la the languages um, 
and the love and the care and compassion that is built into indigenous literature creates this community-based space um, where, which, in which whether or not those edits stick on Wikipedia, and most of them do, to be, <laughs> to be honest, but whether or not they do, um, it is creating spaces um, for uh, the community um, to grow um, and to, um, to explode some of those colonial edifices that we are so immersed in. So these are some of the authors that we've been fortunate enough to work with, to host um, at the Longhouse and this year um, uh, uh, online. Uh, so this year, actually, we were really pleased to welcome Richard Van Camp to come and do a children's reading on a Saturday, which was beautiful. Um, Marilyn DeMont gave a gorgeous talk on poetry and memory, um, and we're really excited um, to be hosting uh, Tennille Campbell um, and in the launch of her new book, Neti Nezu, Our Good Medicine, on March the 24th. So really, I guess this is all mostly driving towards the pitch that you should come and see um, to Neil Campbell on the 24th. Uh, she is um, one of, in my mind, the best poets, uh, best young poets going right now. And she gives uh, the best talks uh, you will likely ever see. So it is uh, definitely good medicine that we could all use at this point. And again, I think the ways in which we can collect um, around indigenous literature and um, can explode these spaces of colonization and push back against what Wikipedia means as a white space, makes those spaces um, viable um, and interesting. So I'm gonna end it there um, and, and pass it back to Aaron, but um, thank you um, all. And I hope we'll see you at, at some of, at Tennille's reading. Thank you, David. Uh, so we will hold questions until after all our speakers have um, had their chance to speak. So I'm just going to move on to uh, our next speaker, who's Tina Liu. Tina Liu is a professor in the Department of History and teaches Canadian and environmental history. Under Wikipedia's education program, she taught a North American environmental history course using Wikipedia. So I will hand it over to Tina. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And thank you, Dave, for that talk. It, I only know you through Twitter. <laughs> so so this, is, uh, this is fortuitous. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I should say that I keep getting, I'm on campus right now. I get internet connection unstable. Uh, so hopefully this will work. Okay, thanks so much. I uh, used Wikipedia in my course history 396, which is a North American environmental history course. And I did that, oh my God, now uh, in 2012. That's a long time ago when uh, there was a, um, a call out from the Wikimedia Foundation for, um, for universities to become involved in, in editing. So that's how I first got involved. And I'm going to talk about, talk about that and, and um, just some practical things that I did, how I actually used it in the classroom. You will all know it's an encyclopedia. And these are some stats, uh, the most recent ones I could find from earlier uh, this year, just about how many articles there are on there um, and how many are in English. Uh, there are a variety of uh, Wikipedia pages in different languages, as most of you will know. It gets a lot of page views. It's a hugely popular reference work. Um, despite what some of our colleagues might say about not looking at Wikipedia, uh, I don't do that. I, I try to get them to think about the sources, the students, the sources they use, and I use it. So it's, it's, it's um, hypocritical to say don't use it. So uh, Dave talked about who uses it, who contributes, and that that was you know the the issue that um, led me to become involved, and it sort of stemmed from Jimmy Wales's philosophy of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is twenty years old now, and he uh, waxed lyrical about the importance of free access to knowledge. But as we all know, one of the questions about that is what is the quality of that knowledge? Uh, I think we've learned uh, in, in, in no small way the importance of accuracy in knowledge 
after four years under the Trump administration. So that led Wikipedia to become, as I understand it, more concerned about, about the quality of knowledge and hence their outreach to universities. Uh, my own <laughs> motives for this were a little less noble. Um, I don't know how many of you have piles of papers like this or used to at the end of a term. These are my uncollected marked essays. And it was just really sad. Students would spend this time writing these major research papers. I would spend all this time marking them and then they would never pick them up. And I, you know, I just thought, what is, what is the point of this? Um, and so I started to rethink um, of how I used writing in the classroom and the kinds of assignments that I wanted students to, um, to engage with. And, I, and, and how, given that they never picked up their papers, clearly this was not a meaningful exercise for them or for me. So that led to me to think about using Wikipedia. And this was, as I said, an environmental history course. So I started to think about ecologies of knowledge and to think about knowledge production in some of the ways that, uh, that David has, um, has set out. Uh, what Wikipedia allows us to think about is uh, knowledge production as the outcome of networks, not so much of individuals. And I think I think uh, Nora Young on Spark once said, you know, the smartest person in the room is the room. So this, this idea that you have a community of people with whom you engage to produce knowledge and that there's expertise in networks. Um, the point about sustainability is that students would be engaged, I hoped, in, in producing something uh, that would last, that would not end up on this pile of a pile in my office and eventually in the recycling bin, that they were going to produce something uh, that they could point to later that they knew people would look at um, and that people that they didn't know would have occasion to look at. So those were some of the kinds of things that um, I went into this thinking about, I started to do a lot of reading about uh, social networks as learning networks um, and trying to harness that power of the social part of Wikipedia, keeping in mind though, the kinds of things that David brought up about who your average Wikipedian uh, was and is. And I'm gonna come back to that now. So what I did was that I did a lot of, um, of front end work identifying topics that had not been addressed uh, in Wikipedia, topics in North American environmental history, almost all of which had some sort of indigenous history angle. Uh, that's not at all surprising. Um, and then I, there was a class of 60. Uh, so I, this was a team project. Uh, there was a little social engineering in creating teams of five and they chose the entry they wanted to work on and um, I had built-in points of uh, check-in where I wanted to make sure the group dynamics were working the way they should. Uh, they also um, had to write a reflective piece in the end talking thinking about the process and talking about their own learning and contribution to that and I'm happy to share those resources with people later if they're they're interested in that. Um, I had a TA for this course, if you're wondering, because it is pretty labor intensive. And then in the end, uh, they needed to uh, present their page to the class as a whole and to talk about the process and what, what they learned, not just factually about whatever it was that they were researching, but just about the, the process of knowledge production which I think in the end was really maybe the, the most value added that got them to think critically uh, about the things that they read and to think about how those things that they read in the classroom journal articles and books 
came to be. Um, writing for Wikipedia is different from the kind of writing that I had been assigning. So it's an encyclopedia. So that's a particular genre of writing. Um, the references are super important. So that, if that was a really um, useful way of teaching them, the students more about the importance of referencing. You have to write for a general audience, so limit the jargon. Um, and it's written to, this is from Wikipedia, to inform, not to instruct or argue a particular point, but clearly Wikipedia articles do argue a particular point. So we, we talked about how to do that in class. Uh, and it's the pro product of some sort of consensus. Um, sometimes that consensus is forced. Uh, there's, and conversation, both among the students who were involved in the project and the larger audience of Wikipedians. Okay, so this different kind of writing was based on the model that Wikipedia has Students and I had had interesting insights on all of this at the at the end, and comparing it to uh, academic writing, um, journal article writing, which they were more used to, uh, both reading and producing in class. So the differences I thought were generative of a good discussion. Um, what I'm going to take you through is some comments. I went back to look in the talk uh, to trace the process of. Um, of how the students um, engaged with Wikipedia and produced their own articles. So I had, I, I, I had them take baby steps at first. They went in and they, uh, I just said, okay, just do an edit and on, on an existing article. And, and they, they became quite self-conscious about intervening uh, to, to correct something and and Norma, Norma wrote uh, in the talk that uh, to tell me that she'd done it, but also to say that she felt wonderfully nerdy. Um, Heather, Heather was nervous. She said it's a little, a little scary. And this was one occasion where somebody else intervened to talk about um, to get, to give Heather, one of my students, encouragement. So just trying to, to th this is a good part of the Wikipedian community, right? So students become self-conscious in a different way about how they're writing. There are of course trolls out there. So, and this is just, this is just an example uh, of one of the, uh, one of the critiques out there. Um, these students were, this group was writing about the WAC Bennett Dam on the Peace River, a, a project that had enormous uh, environmental and social impacts on both indigenous um, communities, but also settler communities. And this person did not like what my students uh, were writing. Um, and just says that this is a dam, not a social studies project, because the students had been writing about the social impacts of, of um, putting a very large structure on a river and turning it into a reservoir. So there, there are going to be trolls. Um, that required my intervention to, with the students just to talk about how you, how you deal with this and how you respond. Uh, but there are also people that Wikipedia calls barn stars, people um, unrelated to the class jumped in to to kind of say, "Hey, back off!" Like so, in response to the guy that said, "This is this is a damn not a social studies project," uh, someone said, "Hey, give them some time. This is you know." There was a, my students had, had, had posted a plan of what they were going to write. So according to the plan, they're going to talk about the construction. They're not just going to talk about social impacts. And, um, and another person uh, chimed in to say that, hey, you know, it's, think of this as a work in progress. It, it has improved over time. So this, is, this was a way to see a kind of peer review 
uh, loosely speaking, in action. And that was a, one of the real learning moments of the course, I think. Uh, here's something else that just reminds us uh, if we, I think we know this intellectually, but we don't always know it kind of emotionally and or even specifically. So another group of students were writing on the Columbia River Treaty. Um, the, high, the Philip there, it was my TA. Uh, and it turns out that the senior policy analyst for the Columbia Treaty Review for the provincial government was watching. This was, this was a real eye opener to us. It just made the point to, to me and to my TA and to the students that what they were writing had a potential impact. And there were all kinds of people out there that were reading what they wrote, not just in, as is traditional, their instructor. So I think for, for all these, for, for that reason and the reasons that David had, had mentioned, the, the, um, the engagement of students in knowledge production and what Wikipedia reveals about the process of knowledge production, I think is really value added. But I would say that if you're going to engage in this exercise, it is a lot of work, at least for the first time as you're as you're learning. Um, there's lots of resources out there that can help you with this assignment. And I certainly am happy to uh, help anybody that wants to undertake this. And so I'm going to stop there and end and say thank you. And of course, the library is ready to help. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of self-promotion there. No, no, well, Erin, um, <laughs> you, you weren't there when I started this. So I was like yeah. looming around. So I'm happy to take advantage of you. <laughs> and when well, I thank teach you. And do. <laughs> that would be great. I will. Thanks so much, so everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, so next, we're going to move on to uh, Christina. Christine D'Onofrio, who is an Associate Professor of Teaching in Art History, Visual Art and Theory, and is a visual artist based in Vancouver, British Columbia. She attended York University in Toronto for her BFA and completed her MFA at the University of British Columbia. Christine has held positions at Emily Carr University of Art and Design University of Toledo and the University of Windsor. She has exhibited her work extensively across Canada at galleries such as Eye Level Gallery, Modern Fuel Gallery, Charles H. Scott Gallery, Republic Gallery, Helen Pitt Gallery, Gallery 44, La Centrale, and WARC Gallery. Christine has also given artist talks and served on panels in various institutions, including the Vancouver Art Gallery and the prestigious Art Now lectures at the University of Lethbridge. Christine works in photography, video, digital media, interactive media, printmaking, sculpture, bookworks, and installation. So I hand it over to Christine. Thanks so much. Oh my goodness, I'll never get used to introductions. Um, thank you, fellow panelists. Of, I feel like there is a lot of overlap of, of what we're thinking and, and actually what's at stake with what we're doing. Um, so I might kind of focus more on a, my sort of style of presenting and, and I might s skip over some elements um, so that it's not too repetitive. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm an artist um, and a teacher, and I, I, I work and practice on these unceded territories of the Musqueam people. Um, and so a lot of my presentation is going to kind of work within the um, artistic sphere. So I'm going to show some art <laughs> and talk about some artists. Um, and it all kind of, I think, is a language that also talks about how knowledge can be shared. Um, and how knowledge can, can surface um, and how we have to do our best to, to broaden how we know. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience um, and this sometimes came in the classroom, but a lot of times it was just sort of a community oriented event of art and feminism. 
Um, but yes, I grew up in a time when, I mean, I, I went to libraries, I looked at library catalogs and little index cards. And then um, as I was going through university, that started to change. And uh, all of a sudden the internet was where you could find information. Um, and so when I grew up, it had a lot of potential. The, the internet was this democratic space where um, new knowledges, overlooked knowledges, sometimes ignored knowledge could have a venue. And, and it did work in that way. We've got, you know, Occupy and we've got the Arab Spring and we've got WikiLeaks and we've got Anonymous and all these really revolutionary possibilities happening with this democratic space. Um, but something else was happening, and this is a piece by Jennifer Chan, it's called Total Jizz Fest, and what she does is she grabs a whole bunch of images from the internet and creates this moving image collage of essentially who created the internet. So the, the people who were building the softwares that would circulate and control and develop rules and systems that would uh, essentially create powers within this world. Um, and for the most part, as you can see here, it's, it's one particular subject position um, that kind of uh, overruled that space. And so um, that subject position's uh, values and attitudes and priorities ended up building the system that would allow for these revolutions to exist. So of course, there's gonna be a limit to, to how they function. Um, and how they would actually, you know, create change um, if they're made in the eyes of where power exists, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, um, in the physical world or in the pre-virtual uh, internet information uh, world. So Wikipedia to me is, is where knowledge is, is literally archived and built. Um, yes, it's this user content generated uh, platform. Uh, this is one of the earlier logos. Um, and so it was supposed to have this idea of the expertise um, to build it up. Um, but of course, within that, and I, I always look to Rachel White Reed's Untitled Library work, um, this is a piece uh, that casts the, the, the not books <laughs> area of a library. And I've always thought that in a way she gives a solid form to the voices that don't get published, the voices that we don't hear in these spaces. Um, so uh, um, dare I say it, that physical reality uh, has now become a part of the reality of the structure of Wikipedia. And we can see this in a lot of examples of like uh, the American, uh, women American novelists being pulled from the American novelist article and then turned into another article so that if you actually looked up American novelists on Wikipedia, there would be no females on that list. Um, the other big controversy was Anika Sarkeesian's uh, Gamergate. She had started with a video uh, a vlog on YouTube where she would talk about how women were depicted in games. Of course, this was a very sensitive territory for game lovers and she was absolutely harassed and bullied both in the physical world and in the virtual world um, uh, in excessive ways to the point that even her web her wikipedia page is a contested ground um, and there were battles live battles going on to edit the page <laughs> um, to have a slant in in the narrative that uh, the editors wanted um, to the point that they had to take away the ability to edit her page and only certain people are allowed to do it because it was such a battleground, such a contentious space. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, I still had this hope of, you know, this, this new information age would allow more uh, voices into uh, the threshold. Um, and there was this amazing event going on. It had started in New York called Art and Feminism, and they were doing these incredible edit-a-thons. I could see pictures on social media of just tons of people gathering together in places like the MoMA, and I couldn't believe Vancouver didn't have one, uh, so I started the Vancouver chapter a year after <laughs> everybody else did um, here in, in, uh, at UBC. So I had, I had just started a, a job here. 
Um, and so, um, you know, it excited me because it gave the potential to give a lot of overlooked artists, um, a, a lot of uh, Indigenous artists as well, are part of that list, um, as, as well as females and, you know, non-binary and non-conforming artists. Um, and I wanted to take my time to build it here. And so over the five years I was working on it uh, to facilitate it, we made tons and tons of new articles. Uh, we eventually started um, fixing up articles so that they were more solid. Um, we um, broadened where we did it. So we started working with the Bel Belkin Art Gallery, which is on campus. Naomi Sawada became a huge figure in, in how this is now uh, going. Uh, the numbers of articles that we created were getting bigger and bigger and we started um, going into more expansive areas um, of, of how uh, overlooked <laughs> uh, figures could be represented. Um, and, and I'm completely proud of it. I, I'm very excited of, about some of the, the sites that we, uh, sorry, articles that we created. This is one of the first, Kate Craig happened in the first year. Um, it was a, this is also when I started making incredible relationships with librarians who are, are wonderful <laughs> people. Um, and so that this site was actually created by four uh, librarians who were one year away from their retirement. And we worked together um, and, and created Kate's page. But we, yeah, there's a ton of pages with incredibly well-cited uh, references that represent a lot of important voices that don't necessarily get published um, uh, as, as much as they should be perhaps. Um, as as part of the world. So um, I, I'm really happy when one of these events finish, um, but the truth is <laughs> they don't finish that sort of edit-a-thon weekend or week, whatever uh, it, it was that year. There's sort of three months of maintenance that goes on to keep these pages up, which you're kind of hearing already. So I, I perhaps won't push it too much, <laughs> um, but it, it is a very contentious thing within, you know, two days, we were starting to get these notes um, and they were um, essentially always questioning if this person deserved an article. Um, and so you'd have to, you know, build um, val validity and notability through the same world that, you know, oppresses certain voices in the dominant system and you're you're using those same factors to prove that they deserve a page on this world so it, it felt like all the things that were an issue with um you know power structures already built were just being perpetuated so it, it felt a little bit like uh, you know a difficult situation uh to come out of um and so a lot of it had to do with notability um you know are these women uh, entitled? Do they warrant <laughs> uh, to be uh, important figures to have an article for them? Um, so there, this is not new as, as you've kind of heard already is there, there's a lot of trolling. There's a lot, there can be a lot of harassment. Um, this is an example. I'll show you a little clip of it. Yeah, mainly in the United States and the People it's a video Pakistan of someone edit Wikipedia article learning about art and feminism. The Titanic, it looks like. Of course, there's few in Europe, none in Germany. Yes, a uh, gaping gap in the Middle East. Some in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan. None in Australia. Good for you. And one in the island of sheep fuckers. And yeah, they are going to edit feminist bias into Wikipedia articles. And when from the fourth and I always thought that was really funny to edit feminist bias in Wikipedia articles <laughs> as if Wikipedia doesn't have is its own bias um, so uh, I didn't want to leave it on his his voice and his image so I'm, I'm, I'm showing Marianne Nicholson's page she's she makes incredible work and actually had a work up outside of the Belkin for many years um, and so I wanted to end there that there is a lot of hope in what, what this can do um, and why I keep doing it and why I keep participating. 
Um, but um, yeah, it's it's been a difficult road, and um, the, I think that the the system has been created to um, uh, a specific uh, positioning, and and it makes me worried that you know with the prevalence of internet of uh, information age, um, how knowledge is disseminated much more through these means uh, than the good old book anymore. Um, and yet um, there's particular figures that are uh, owning in a way the, the system. And it's been built in a particular viewpoint uh, that we have to kind of work within. And so I'm, I'm concerned <laughs> that, you know, as we become more and more digitized and, and information and knowledge are through these means, um, what it means that uh, certain ethics and, and certain sort of values are not represented. Um, so I, I might gracefully leave it there because I know that Amber has worked more on the system side of things. And, um, and I think I'm going to pass the torch onto that buildup. <laughs> Well, wow, thank you for that, Christine. And I think I, I share many of your concerns. Um, but I would like to introduce our last speaker, uh, Amber Burson, who is a writer, curator, and PhD candidate conducting doctoral research at Queen's University on artist-run culture and feminist utopian thinking. She most recently curated Super Spaghetti with Menon Tourney, Utopia as Method, World Cup, The Letdown Reflex with Juliana Drever, uh, Trail Mix and Jennifer X Jennifer with Eliane Elbigen, the annual Art Administrator's Relay Race with Nicole Barish, and the Wild Bush Residency. There's also the 2016 Curator in Residence as part of the France-Quebec Cross Residency at uh, Astrid de Marseille, France. She's a co-lead at Art and Feminism, a project that works for more equitable Wikipedia. It was the 2019-2020 Wikipedia in Residence at Concordia University. She is also the Programming co Coordinator at Art Kill. So I shall hand it over to Amber. I'm going to talk today about my work with art and feminism, and it's going to build a lot on what my colleagues have said. So first of all, hello, bonjour. I'm here in Montreal, um, also known as Drug Drage, also known as Muniag, the unceded traditional territory of the Ganyakahaga Nation. And you can find me on Wikipedia as user 13EB37 if you want to connect. Um, I'm not going to like tell you about what I do, but I will tell you about my connection with art and feminism, and I'll leave this up on the screen for you to look at. I started working with art and feminism in uh, 2014, so in the first year, I organized an event in Montreal, and uh, Jackie, one of the, um, the founders of the project, invited me to do this project. And she's like, just, just organize an event. It's not hard. I was like, absolutely not, um, with an expletive in the middle of that sentence, because I don't know anything about Wikipedia, and I have no interest in learning. No, I should say my background's in art history. Obviously, I'm very interested in um, making knowledge more accessible and making it more equitable. But the idea of working on this platform was terrifying to me. And then I had the thought, well, if it's terrifying for me, it's probably terrifying for other people and I should put my adult pants on and do this one event. And at that first event, um, we were physically trolled. So we had a physical troll come into our event and tell us how and what to edit into the project. And it was a shock and it really emboldened me to continue doing this work. Um, so now eight years later, I'm still here and now I'm a co-lead at the, pro the project. We started this project because there was a big um, gap in who edited. So not just the material, but who edited. The original statistics we worked on said that 10% of Wikipedia's editors identified as cis or trans women. But then in 2018, the foundation itself updated these stats and they're exactly the same. It's equally bad in the art world. I'm not gonna get into this because I wanna talk about all the other things, but women, trans, um, trans and cisgendered women, not represented in art history. We also know that on Wikipedia itself, women um, are two times more likely to be new editors and two times as likely to live in Asia and three times as likely to live in Africa, but they are more likely to feel less empowered on Wikipedia than other new editors. So they're less likely to stick around. And we'll talk about why. So we started um, at first just by organizing the events 
And that was really successful. We went from 30 in the first year to I think 300 at one point. And this year, in spite of the fact that we're in COVID and we can't meet in person, we have over 100 events globally. But then we started uh, realizing but what we really needed were resources. So right away, we started developing how to edit guides and um, tools for people to organize their own events. And many of you probably have seen these uh, and worked with them. And they're translated into a bunch of different languages. What we also realized is that people needed safety tools. So um, not just a safe and brave space policy, which of course was incredibly helpful in determining what could happen in events and like how things would go down, but also um, information on how to handle harassment on Wikipedia. So some of you have already mentioned your experience with trolling um, and both like the, the light end of just having your uh, material deleted, but also the, the more extreme end. So in any this case, what we realized is that on Wikipedia, if you experience harassment and you want to make a claim, it's almost impossible to find that information unless you're an extremely experienced editor. So that means that you'd have to have years and years of uh, access, but you'd also have to know a certain amount of wiki code because none of that information was available using a visual editor. So you wouldn't be able to make that claim unless you knew how to do coding. We brought together all this information under the security toolkit, which you can find on our website. And I think that was already dropped in the chat and it was just a really powerful tool. We are so started hosting community hours. So these are like online talks on different subjects and it can be um, really light, like how to pick a theme or, um, you know, how, how do we think about um, um, this tool? And it can, it can definitely be about meteor topics. And these are uh, determined by the regional ambassadors and other members of our community. We also started developing remote learning tools and virtual event resources. And these are in response to the fact that our community is more and more online, not just because of the pandemic, but definitely in part because of the pandemic. As we continued with our work, we realized that it wasn't enough to just do these events and develop tools. We also had to go in and start doing um, behind the scenes advocacy work. So one of the projects we worked on in the past year was as part of the 2030 strategy, which is the 10 year plan um, with like a strategic plan for the Wikimedia movement. There was the development of the Universal Code of Conduct, which was adopted um, on February 2nd. So it's brand new. And I think that will go into the chat now as well. And what this tool do, does is it provides a baseline of acceptable behavior for people who benefit from funding primarily on Wikipedia. So as editors, you are not impacted by re as readers, you are not impacted. But as participants in the larger project, you are bound to a certain code of conduct. Of course, we're only in the phase where we've developed what the behaviors are. We haven't developed any kind of enforcing tools. And what's great about this is that if you're interested in becoming involved, you can participate in this advocacy work as well. So we know, and we've already talked about this, that Wikipedia's um, notability guidelines reproduce structural sexism and racism just across the board. But we also realized that a big piece of this was what was considered reliable. So if you want to have a notable article, you need a reliable resource. And what is considered a reliable source on Wikipedia upholds a certain understanding of um, academic rigor that doesn't necessarily respond to the needs of our communities and also the realities of our communities. So we began this project called Reading Together and the report will be released this month. It will be released this month. You're all holding me accountable to this and it will be released in English, French and Spanish that talks about who develops the guidelines and how they're patrolled. So what we learned is that the guidelines for reliable sources are uh, a not always guidelines. So guidelines are official rules on Wikipedia, but sometimes they're actually just essays and people patrol our work based on things that are determined in essays, which are simply put just one person's opinion of what could happen on Wikipedia. So they're not um, a user generated guideline for the platform. We also learned that in general, the guidelines reproduce um, or have been translated from the English directly. And so they uphold a standard of um, what is reliable based on an Anglo-Saxon determination of what is reliable. So we're hoping that this study helps to produce guidelines for building beyond that. And then finally, what we learned is that the people who patrol this work 
um, are generally new page patrollers. And so they go into new pages and decide whether the page is a notable enough and whether the sources uphold it. Those people, um, they auto enroll in that process, but you need 500 edits in order to become a new page patroller, which means that somebody like myself who has been working on Wikipedia in this like more advocacy capacity for eight years, does not, ha I don't have enough edits to participate in new page patrollers, which means that we have this huge gap in not just who edits and what type of material is edited, but how we maintain these pages and how we uphold the information. So earlier, um, David, you talked about like how we can chip away the colonial control of knowledge, but the reality is that we as editors can do that behind the scenes. We have mostly still the white male uh, North American Anglophone um, from Christian countries, patroller and administrator who are systematically preventing this work from staying on the platform. So that has been the bulk of the work that we've been focused on on the back end, and that I'm excited to continue doing. Um, and that's that's sort of all the of what I want to talk about for now because I'm really excited about the conversation and the overlap between our presentations. So I'll leave this up. Great, thank you, Amber. I'm excited to see that reading together piece because one of the biggest conversations that I have when working in Wikipedia as a librarian is about authority of sources. <laughs> so that's yeah. really good to hear that that work's being done. Yeah. So we are at our uh, question discussion time. And of course, if you have a question, please feel free to put them in the chat and um, I will work to ask our, our uh, panelists here to, to answer those. Um, but maybe just as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I can start off um, with a, a fairly, I, I like looking at Wikipedia and sort of the things that are coming out that are contentious uh, with the tool or um, problems that seem to arise. Um, but recently, like a few weeks ago, the Wikipedia co-founder, Larry Sanger, slammed Wikipedia as a having a leftist bias and claiming the days of neutrality are long gone. Uh, and so we've sort of touched upon a few of these things, I think, in our conversations. I just wanted to ask um, anybody, our panelists here, knowing how each of you work within Wikipedia, what are your thoughts around this notion of, um, neutrality, but especially this, this notion of that leftist piece. So I leave it open to you. It, uh, I'll, be, I'll be real brief with it, but it, I think my, the pages that we create are very neutral. The, the, I actually think we're very good at just stating this is where they, this artist showed this is their nominal works so like the it um i think it's incredibly neutral where the bias exists is determining if they should be having an article or not in general so if that if having representation of other voices is bias then i probably <laughs> but i i obviously don't agree with that i i think that there's of other knowledges out there and so so yeah I, I guess I would answer that that way I I think my pages are super neutral <laughs> but of course you would say that Christine <laughs> so I mean I, I I appreciate what you said and I would have thought that the, the pages my students produced were neutral too, but you saw in my example when some students started to talk about the environmental and social effects of damming a river, there were some out there who said, that's not, this is not a social studies project. So what this person seemed to want was, okay, this dam is this high, it generates this much power, um, you know, and, and it, was built in this state and it continues to run, it was modified. Um, so even a, a tackling um, an aspect of, of this subject that's well documented in the, liter in the academic literature, 
was contentious. And certainly that person thought it was a leftist bias. And at the very least, we needed to talk too about benefit, right? What's the benefit? And so the students and I talked about this and, and you know, what we came back with was uh, costs to whom and benefits to whom, right? So sure, it's, it's like, we don't want to do the, make the mistake of on one hand, on the other hand, and treat them as equal, but we also, you know, which is the problem with some journalism. Um, we do, however, want to, to, to talk about who benefits and who doesn't. So that's how we got around that one. But I don't know that the person who thought this was a social studies project was, was satisfied. But um, I looked at the page and most of what we had in there is still there. I would say that, you know, as somebody who teaches um, at under, many undergrads how to edit, the reality is, is that there is a leftist bias in what many of them are putting in. And that's okay because it's a user generated platform with a lot of people who can go in and make sure that it remains neutral. And that also you have a balanced approach. Um, we often as educators forget that our students, especially in their earliest years, don't know the difference between a secondary, a tertiary and a primary source. And so they write in a tone that is perhaps not appropriate for Wikipedia. And it is our job as uh, Wikipedia educators to like, direct them in the right direction of tone and um, proper use of sources. And it's the same reason why people don't want us to use Wikipedia as a source in our teaching. It's because it's a tertiary source and you never would teach your students to like only cite a dictionary. You want them to learn to use secondary sources. I would say that um, when he made that comment, he was perhaps misguided because if anything, the foundation has become much more open to a concept of knowledge equity um, and to putting its money where its mouth is and funding projects um, that are more geared towards that, but that it also uh, has aligned itself with definitely not leftist projects like Google and like Microsoft, and it directly benefits from, um, from those relationships and not just financial relationships, but this, this visibility relationship. Um, and so I would say that as much as he's saying that he did leave the project in its in its first year of existence. So perhaps he's a little bit divorced from its reality. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so just taking a look at uh, questions coming in. So Christina had a question of, for those teaching this in undergraduate or graduate classes, could you talk more about how you scaffolded the assignments and how much of the course this represented or how many sessions it involved? Um, well, I guess <laughs> I certainly used it in class. It probably represented in all about half uh, uh, of the grade for uh, the writing, and it was certainly scaffold. It's a lot of work for the students. So um, they, I, as I sort of suggested, they had to, there's the technical part about learning how you go in and actually do it. That's actually, uh, that wasn't as big a deal as, as I thought, but at every, when they were writing, they would write it in sections. So I would have it scaffolded they would have to come up with an outline and then we would have sequential due dates for each section. Um, they engaged in peer review. The, the group of five would review each other's writing and, um, and then there was the moment before it went live. So there was a bunch of stuff that was done in the sandbox before it went live. Then it went live and then, um, and then there were subsequent edits that um, uh, there were subsequent times where they had to complete edits throughout the course. So it was broken down. I, in this class, I have weekly discussions and usually in those discussions, we're, we're reading an article that's related to the lecture material for the week, but we also spent the other half of the class uh, talking just about their Wikipedia articles, so I can keep everybody on track. So that's that's how I scaffolded it. So it was scaffolded pro probably from about week three, because that's when the enrollment of the class settled, because there's that time where there's the shopping and people are coming in and out. 
then we had a, a stable class size. And so probably from week three to week 13, um, well, was the time we were working on the articles and probably from week three to week 10 was the real scaffolding. Um, I just uh, do that Google Doc up that I said I would before. This is sort of the, I've really, for, for me, and this is something that Aaron and I worked on together, is the, um, the gap analysis is the most significant part of the assignment for me. So that's, that's the sort of the critical reading part of the assignment, where we get students to identify something on Wikipedia that, that they think needs to be um, addressed or redressed. Um, and then working to find sources that would support their point of view to bring that that neutral point of view um, and then building an argument around it using some of the other work on Wikipedia and indigenizing Wikipedia by folks like um, Siobhan Asenye. Um, so that the, we that's our, our midterm assignment. So we build towards that. Aaron comes in and talks with students. We go over what it means to do critical reading on Wikipedia, what notability means, um, how they can intervene, what the consequences of those interventions might mean. Um, and then actually for us, the edit, edits themselves are almost, um, are in a lot of ways an afterthought. We do them. So everyone writes their own gap analysis, and then we get people like who are want to do are doing something in the arts, and someone who is doing something on politics, or someone who is doing community, and then we build groups around those sort of categories, um, and then in groups they work to edit a particular page, <clears throat> um, and we support them through that. We do it in class, um, sometimes one or two sessions. Um, but again, that, that I really put the emphasis on the gap analysis, and then I say, well. Now we're going to get you in Wikipedia. We're going to show you how easy it is, but a lot of this stuff won't stay up. We, I get them to keep track of the the trolling and that kind of, and I to bring that into class so we can talk about that as well because I think it's a, important to debrief um, and to give them a sense and to 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 engage with those comments um, and don't let, not to make them do it themselves. Um, so. Uh, for me, that's that's been the, and they the students love the assignment. They love the gap analysis. It really gives them insight into the ways because it's a course on indigenous representation. So it really gives them insight into the the continued ways um, in which settler colonialism is enacted in in this encyclopedia. Um, uh, so they they really like it. I always get really great feedback on it, and they they like getting their hands dirty with Wikipedia, um, but. But to be honest, I don't I don't put as much emphasis on on the editing itself as I do on the, the analysis piece. But that's just the way that I come at it. Yes, um, I I use it. Um, it is about representation for me. So uh, I really do encourage new articles. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that works the best with they're, they're very excited. So they're, they're very excited to put, you know, um, Kim Mortal, you know, a non-binary <laughs> rapper <laughs> to have presence on, on the page. So I, I think the investment is huge sometimes. I, I can't get it with other work, even though I teach art. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that really works is the fact that they can build uh, a Wikipedia address together and almost use the, the sandbox in Wikipedia as their group communication area and they're literally building it up together and and so what ends up happening is they help each other know how to better cite something or how to you know this needs a site because it's not it's you know you're imposing something so i find the the sort of peer connections that happen really fruitful because in a way they're teaching each other how to cite and and when something needs to be backed up and and in a weird way, I kind of get away with not having to teach that over and over and over again. Um, so I'd say that's that's the most handy thing for me. But yeah, there's definitely ways you can scaffold. I could share everything with you, my presentations, my rubrics, no problem. Uh, but it really is the process that, that you'll you'll watch your students go through. That's really interesting. <laughs> Great. So a question has come in from Daniel. This is something that was touched on a bit in David and Tina's segments and maybe others. Do any of you have any thoughts on storing parts of your own ongoing or developing research and citations in a good quality Wikipedia article? And how about the drawbacks to using it that way? I'm not sure I have, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
I have not, uh, for all I've used Wikipedia, it's been in the classroom and I actually haven't generated content of my own, which is, is kind of, uh, maybe I should, and it would be an interesting way of, of um, making my own work more public facing. Um, I'm not, so no, it's, I haven't, I, so I don't have any good ideas, I'm afraid. Maybe David does. <laughs> Kind of in the same boat as you, Tina. I don't. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't done a lot of writing on on Wikipedia. It's mostly through my students that I engage. Um, I, I do like using the online sources, though, as as starting places for research. So I have a blog where often I will get those things started, and then strangely, some of the times that blog will get cited in a Wikipedia article. So <laughs> I find. I'm like, well, that's kind of a half-baked idea. I don't know if that, <laughs> but uh, some, often that will, it'll stick uh, for some reason, but it does come around in those, those sort of circles. So I, I do think, I always tell my students that, you know, find any way that you're getting writing and ideas out, because I think some of them are, get so, they're so worried about getting ideas in the world that it's like a constipation that sort of happens. So I'm always encouraging whatever works for you to get ideas out in the world. I um, mean, it could, be, sometimes it's that collective process of writing together, like Christine is talking about, right? Um, so getting the words out and mixing them together is, is, is a good way to come at it. So if Wikipedia does it for you, Daniel, if there's places where you get, are getting those words out, for me, it was a blog, um, uh, then I think, you know, use, use those, those spaces for whatever they're worth. And um, I would add that you would want to be cautious about how you include um, material that's clearly linked to your research because you want to avoid conflict of interest editing, so which is one of the pillars of Wikipedia. So you want to just be really transparent about why you're adding that in and maybe in your user bio um, having a statement about what you're doing and why, because of course um, it's not a place for self-promotion and that's not what I'm accusing you of doing in any way, but you want to avoid any kind of opportunity for somebody to remove your hard work because they see it as a potential conflict of interest. All right, thank you. Uh, so I have another question from Jordan. I see that many of these events occur in an academic environment, which is important, but are there also events or initiatives for those outside of this setting? I, I, mine, for the most part, have taken place in, um, in uh, galleries, <laughs> um, but it, it is it, it has this community oriented, uh, and also some of the galleries are on campus. So then it does have this academicized um, point to it. But yeah, I've I've we've had a, a, a session at the Western Front Gallery, which is in Mount Pleasant. Um, <laughs> so um, it does bring in a different crowd. It does actually pull uh, what we're doing um, into the community more and people can see that they have leverage <laughs> um, even though they're not at the institution so um, it and it's even nicer when there's you know students that are in my classes helping uh, community members who want to have something represented uh, to, to show them how so I, I think they feel um, useful that they can show their academic chops and their researching chops to uh, to someone else's benefit, you know? Some of the most productive events that I've been to have built on um, intergenerational community knowledge, uh, not in an academic setting. And so you're having people who have the knowledge of what you want to write about. And if secondary sources exist, can, you know, point you towards them, but if not, can help you develop um, some of the other material that helps you build the article. So that could be images that are added to the comments that help support your article or it's uh, linked wiki data. Um, creating a Wikipedia page is really fantastic, but it's not the only intervention in the project. There's lots of ways to to work with the constraints that you have on Wikipedia to um, to include more voices. So yes, I would say that there's lots of projects happening outside of the academic setting, not just in GLAM, so um, in libraries and museums and art galleries, but um, in lots of community spaces across the world. So I can point a link for ones in Canada if you want. Okay. Uh, so there are no more questions in the chat, but I do have a question um, because we we're talking about 
public scholarship uh, and Wikipedia. Uh, and we're looking at that relationship between higher education and the public and making visible and accessible knowledge. Um, but sometimes that process, we can forget sort of that reciprocal nature of knowledge creation. And I was just wondering, um, how do you build that relationship that is inclusive and collaborative, especially since we're talking about specific communities, right? like Indigenous communities, or we're talking about artists, feminists, or female artists, or non-binary um, artists. So I was wondering, what does that look like inside of, of your work? That's a great question, Erin. And I, and I think, um, what I'm really proud of what Honoring Indigenous Writers has done, and this is thanks to the work that you and Alex have put in, is, is that it's basing it on relationality, right? That we, we reach out to authors beforehand. Um, we, we, are, we are building on existing relationships that we have. Um, so, you know, before Billy Ray Belcourt was the, the poet extraordinaire that he is now, uh, he needed a Wikipedia page, and we worked with him to help get one up. Um, Beth LaPonce, um, a, a game designer, reached out the other day because she really hated the photo of her that was up <laughs> on there. Um, so it really, and that, that was just her texting me and being like, I hate this photo. Like, you're, <laughs> is there anything we can do? Uh, and so I think a lot of my students, um, when I, when I, first started doing this were, you know, they're worried, they're worried about having stuff, their work represented out there, and they're worried about offending people, rightfully, right? So um, being, building in uh, consent and relationality, which is the foundation of what we do in Indigenous studies, into that work, um, I think makes it, it stronger and makes it, helps us embrace it in the discipline um, in ways um, that make it effective for us. And, and I, I think with, without that piece, um, it would be a much more difficult um, process to go through. Um, so, so, and continuing to grow those relationships as, as the, the events, the festival unfolds is, is an important part of the work. It's strange. I think um, <laughs> I, I have a bit of a mix with this one because, um, so we, you know, someone wants to represent someone, um, usually more of an honoring um, <laughs> and then uh, they start building the page and then it, sometimes they bring that person in and all of a sudden the the, the trolling that happens starts to <laughs> um, become part of the psyche of the person who's um, building an article and and you you know sometimes these are uh, women who've been doing this for a long time are and <laughs> and and they're seeing a different world that um, sometimes I feel guilty for bringing them in like <laughs> exposing them to how uh, knowledge is being um, defended and uh, they don't have a right to to be part of the conversation so I, I do have mixed feelings of sometimes we've brought people in to help us clarify something or to ask them for a copyright free image that we can add to the commons. Um, and, and, uh, and I have found myself kind of defending the talk pages from them, uh, which thankfully they don't always know are there and, and asking, you know, uh, contributors as well to do the same that we, we can handle this for them. They don't have to go through this because it becomes part of, you know, their entire sort of knowing who they are. Um, so uh, I think reciprocity is definitely there because uh, they wouldn't have a page without us going hard um, on this. Um, but yeah, there's sometimes when they're brought in that um, I actually <laughs> feel bad about exposing them to <laughs> um, the realities of, of how knowledge is being, uh, yeah defended for certain values. I, I, it's not so hopeful. I, I realize that, but <laughs> I think the pages up are the hopeful part. Well, I would, I would say it's hopeful because we're acting as a space to try and get it happening without potentially causing any, any 
trolling or anything negative on the actual artist or, or the individuals themselves. We're acting as kind of a nice barrier that's willing to fight the fight. Fortunately, it is a fight, <laughs> but you know, at least somebody is doing that, right? Um, add to what Christine said, I, I, in my own writing on Wikipedia and then in my teaching, I do encourage people to get permission, but I also encourage them to mention that they're not responsible for what happens forever and that the like there there is a, a burden that is associated with it of that maintenance and you are responsible for it for a certain period but that it is possible that things will be put on there that are not what you want included on there but nonetheless reflect things that are produced in secondary sources and so we can commit to removing things that are untrue and we can commit to um, making sure that it's uh, respectful in its tone but our responsibilities as editors are not to protect the person from things that they don't like about themselves that have been published. And so I really want to highlight that because this comes up quite often, actually. Yeah, I think thanks for making that point, Amber. That that was out of a different Indigenous literature editathon that happened with colleagues. There was actually a poet um, who was very upset at what was represented on that page. Um, but all of that, that in, the information that was collected was truthful information that was published elsewhere. Uh, and that, that, that poet didn't like how it was being compiled in this page. Uh, and so there were a lot of labor went into being like, look, this is not <laughs> like, like, yes, we want to work in good relation with you, but this is also, this is the, this is what Wikipedia is. And this is how this information was arrived at. And it really, it became a quite a difficult thing. Um, so there is, I think that there's that, I think that that's a really important point, right, is that, that is being open that this is, you know, we are not going to be here safeguard, we're not going to be gatekeepers for this space for you, so you can look in a certain way. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a tricky conversation to have too, right, but I think it's an important one, especially when we have students doing this work who have other things to do, right, um, they can't, they can't be up all night um, uh, arguing over, over stuff on a page. It, it, actually, this is a really great question. <laughs> it's going into some great areas, but um, I think something else that happens, and, and I've had that experience as well, where the person is kind of like, why do we have to include that? And it's, well, <laughs> it's, it's from a, a, a credible source. Um, but yeah, uh, the other thing is I do find that students start to understand, or students or even contributors that aren't students, start to have a more meta understanding about knowledge. and and how it is iterative and how it builds. So I've also had, you know, pages that my students have started and then a year later, the page is so much longer and they are overjoyed and they'll send me emails after their graduation about, did you see what happened to Cheryl Hondrell's book? <laughs> and it's, and then of course they check it out and it's incredible to see. So there is also this sort of um, value of how you're, you're, you're sparking the seed that ends up contributing to all this knowledge having a place to grow and um and, and so yeah sometimes that is uh, not always every, to everybody's satisfaction but sometimes it's really inspiring them to see how knowledge is iterative how it it does kind of uh, build up upon something and and it could live in contradiction um so yeah it's that's actually a really great point <laughs> thank you so we are at our time, well, slightly over our time, <laughs> but uh, I didn't want to stop that, that discussion because it's very interesting. Um, so I want to thank all of you uh, for attending, but also thank you to our presenters. This was a really interesting discussion and, and very thoughtful and it's always exciting to talk about uh, Wikipedia and the ways that we engage with it. Uh, again, thank you to the um, Public Humanities Hub for hosting this and um, of course interest in honoring Indigenous writers on Wikipedia. It's still happening this month so we hope to see you there. Um, but again, thank you all and um, I hope you have a great day. <laughs>